What's going on, ninjas? Welcome back to Whiteboard Friday. Today, what we're going to be talking about is the cloud. Now, before we can really get to the cloud, let's talk about what's virtualization. Virtualization is just software pretending to be hardware. Let's say I have my computer, and my computer runs Windows 8. Well, inside of my Windows 8 operating system, I've probably got something like Microsoft Word, an application, or Microsoft Excel, another application. Well, VMware, for example, or VirtualBox, is going to be an application, but this application, rather than just being a word processor or a spreadsheet application, this application pretends to be a computer. I mean, that's literally what it does. You're going to spin up VMware or whatever your virtualization platform of choice is, and now you're going to put in a CD or a .iso file, which is basically a CD, and then you're going to install an operating system. And now, while VMware is running and that CD is installing the operating system, that CD that you're installing, when it's talking to VMware, VM's going, VMware is going, hey, I'm a hard drive. Hey, I'm a CD-ROM. Hey, I'm a network card. Hey, I'm a video card. So the software, that's the, the operating system that's being installed, thinks it's being installed on real hardware when it's really not. Now, the resources that you allocate in terms of disk space and RAM, random access memory, come from the real operating system. So if the real operating system has, let's say, four gigabytes of RAM, it's not uncommon to allocate one gigabyte of RAM to your virtual machine, as an example. Right? So you can install lots of different operating systems. And you can even run them at the same time as long as the host operating system has enough resources for the guest operating systems to run. So VMware or VirtualBox or Parallels or Zen or whatever your preference is just pretends to be hardware and allows you to run multiple operating systems on one physical host. Well, that's great. A lot of us love virtualization. As you started to get into the systems administration world, a lot of sysadmins started moving to virtualized platforms. They had really, really powerful servers, and oftentimes you'd look at your server and you'd realize it's only at like 1 or 2 percent utilization. And they would have a boatload of disk space. So it started to get really convenient to just make a virtual machine of an operating system because once you make it, you can copy it. It's literally just a file. You know, you have a file and you copy a file. You can do that with virtual machines. So instantiating, you'll hear that, spinning up a virtual machine becomes very fast because once I build one, now it's just copying a file. So it got really, really convenient. Well, you started to get some companies that have lots and lots of servers. And those server providers, aka hosting companies, what used to be called, uh, you know, just hosting providers, eventually some of them started to transition into what are called cloud providers. And they started to offer some services. One of the services is called infrastructure as a service. You need some additional servers. Hey, I need two server 2012 servers. I need a couple of Linux servers. Uh, and give me some ones that are running uh, SQL Server and one that's running Oracle. And I really need it right away. Well, in the old world, you would have to go out, buy a server, physical server, install Windows, install Oracle, build the database. And it did take you, excuse me, it, not only would it take you a long time, but it was really labor intensive and you required a whole lot of skills to do it. Well, as soon as you started to move into this infrastructure as a service, someone, rather than running like Windows or Server 2012, ran what's called a hypervisor. And it's just an operating system, some people call it a microkernel. It's not even a full-blown operating system. It does nothing but run virtual machines. Hope I didn't knock that. I hope you can read that. But anyways, so what it does is now 
I'm a hosting company and you need a server. Well, I've got, remember I said those copies? We'll call those templates. And I'll go, well, what do you need? Okay, well, I've got a server 2012 template. Boom. And as soon as you click it, it's running. So you don't have to do the install. You don't have to buy the hardware. I got it. I just copy that file and I'll give you access to it. There you go. Now you've got a server. Oh, you need more RAM? Not a problem. I'll flip this knob and I'll give you some more RAM. Oh, you need more disk space? Flip this knob. You've got more disk space. Oh, you need 10 more. Flip this knob. Boom. 10 more servers are running. So infrastructure as a service is something that a lot of people are really starting to enjoy because the payment plans for it make sense. My, my ability to spin up a server very quickly, not have to do all that development and install and all that, and it's just up and running. And now I'm only paying a small monthly fee. I don't even need to pay for the licensing for all the Microsoft and the Oracle and all that SQL server. It's just part of the pricing. So I'll either pay a small monthly fee or I'll do a pay as you go where I'm only charged while it's running. So if it only runs for an hour and 10 minutes, I'm only charged for the hour and 10 minutes. So infrastructure as a service is really, really popular for that. Rapid, rapid server deployment, rapid, rapid server deployment, and a pricing model that really fits it. You just can't deploy this kind of stuff in your own infrastructure that fast, that cheap. The next thing that you're going to hear about is platform as a service. Now, let's say we are an uh, IT company and we're developing software products. And we're developing a product and we need our product to run in Linux. And we're not Linux developers or vice versa. We're Linux developers. We're not Windows developers. What platform as a service is, is someone will spin up all these machines for me. But just like an infrastructure as a service, Platform as a service, they're gonna give me a little bit more than just the server. They're gonna give me the server, and the server will be configured with Visual Studio, Jira, or any or Eclipse. And all my full-blown development environment is done, ready to go. So not only does the server spin up, but now the server's got Visual Studio, it's got SharePoint, it's got all the development libraries. And what this allows me to do is, if I'm a developer, I can develop for whatever my customer's platform is much faster. So you spin up, just like infrastructure as a service, spin up all the servers I need. I need you to join them to Active Directory. I needed to have SharePoint. I needed to have Microsoft Link. I needed to have all these cool whiz bang things, plus my full blown development environment. And now, boom, it's all up and running. So now I don't need to pay for all of that infrastructure. I don't need to pay for all that licensing and the ability for me to quickly test my code on all these different platforms really makes rapid application development possible. We have a faster time to market for the software that we develop. That's platform as a service. So it's really infrastructure as a service. It's just me spinning up virtual machines. But when I spin up these virtual machines, they've got the software and the libraries and all the really cool things that I need. The last one that you're going to hear about is called software as a service. Software as a service is still this, but I don't get to see any of this. It's just an application. Now, you're starting to see a lot of this with things like Salesforce, uh, Zoho, uh, WebEx, GoToWebinar, GoToMeeting. Uh, these are software as a service products where it's just a piece of software. I need video conferencing. So, you know, something like uh, join.me, uh, 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 join.me is probably a better example. Join.me, where you just go, you know what? Hey, man, let's me and you share desktops real quick. We'll go to join.me, the website. I'll put in this code, and now, boom, you can drive my, my desktop. Okay, that's software as a service. Or let me set up a quick WebEx so that we can have a quick video conference. Or let's build our customer relationship database and it's so much faster uh, because I just log in, I assign my salespeople roles, and within a few minutes, we're working. Okay, it's software as a service. Now, if I need to spin up and add on a thousand salespeople, well, 
in a traditional environment, that'd be a lot of work. In software as a service, you know, just click and I'm charged for more users that I'm adding, right? Upload the spreadsheet of all my users and their passwords and, you know, away we go. So software as a service takes that same model, pay as you go or pay a small monthly fee, and this ability to rapidly spin up with the demand is one of the key things that this virtualization finally gave us in the form of the cloud. Okay, so now that we got that, the next thing I often get asked about is, where's my data? You know, where the, is, is my data safe in the cloud? You hear that all the time. And the best thing I can tell you is, well, let's figure out what type of cloud we're talking about. So the first thing is a private cloud. All the stuff is, is VMware or some sort of virtualization platform. Now, do you want to have your virtualization platform down the hall? Just walk down and it's in your server room? Or do you not care that it's in Florida or in Reston or in Houston or, it, you know, you don't care where it is. If it's private, it's yours in your data center down the hall. If it's public, it's out somewhere on the internet in some hosting company. If it's hybrid, you've got a combination of on-premise and some stuff that's out there and you move data back and forth, right? So you're starting to see a lot of hybrid cloud today. Now, the where's my data at and how secure it is, is a matter of, the best thing I like to say is, you're only limited to your checkbook. If you want patch management, configuration management, change management, uh, vulnerability scanning, intrusion detection, periodic penetration tests, source code review, third-party validation, uh, verified verification that all of the admins that are working in, the, in your environment have uh, key escrow and background checks and security clearances and all that kind of stuff, all of that is going to be something that you lay out and pay for in your service level agreement. So with that in mind, the security of the cloud is really no different than the security of your data center down the hall. You know, the people who are working there, you need to have background checks and you got to do patch management, change management, configuration management. You have to do your due diligence, right? So when your data is in the cloud, it's the same thing. You don't need to make it such a big deal, right? If whatever you're worried about, hey, I need my data to not pass this geographical boundary, you have to get some sort of service level agreement that's going to verify, right, trust but verify, verify that what you want is going to happen with your data, right? And that's what your service level agreements are going to be for. And then you're going to need to do some validation to make sure that it's happening. And that's it. Okay. <clears throat> Last part. How do I get started? I want to try some of this cloud stuff. Uh, and, you know, not exactly rolling in dough here. How do I get rolling? What I would say to do is definitely get started with your infrastructure as a service stuff. So the easiest infrastructure as a service stuff to get moving with is going to be your Amazon and your Microsoft Azure. So Amazon Elastic Cloud EC2. So as soon as you start jumping on that, both of these have a free tier where you can spin up virtual machines, allocate resources. It's kind of this kind of environment. You could spin up virtual machines, allocate resources, and, and as long as you don't use over a certain amount, it stays free. So in your virtual environment, you can have virtual routers, virtual switches, VLANs, access control lists, storage area networks, network attached storage, all of the cool whiz-bang features that you have in your infrastructure, you can have inside of your virtual environment. And you can get that stuff in here. So literally, you can build a full-blown network with all the cool stuff, Cisco routers and switches and Linux and Windows servers and Active Directory and SharePoint and Radius and all the stuff that you would build in a regular infrastructure, you can build it in your virtual infrastructure. It's absolutely no real limit. Now, what about your platform as a service? Your platform as a service, there aren't as many providers, but there's still a pretty fair amount 
companies like CloudShare, companies like SkyTap. Now, these don't have free tiers, but what they do have is a trial period. So you can get in there and you can spin up full-blown platforms, SharePoint, Visual Studio, you know, Linux development environments, Java development environments, where you can get in there and play and program and do all that stuff. And you can spin up your environment. All you do is give them your email. Uh, most of them don't even take a credit card. You can get in there and play until you're ready to transition to the paid tier. So you can at least get a week or two in these types of environments. Now the software as a service thing, that's going to be your stuff like Salesforce, Zoho, uh, GoToMeeting, WebEx, that, that kind of stuff. And you can get out there and if you need to hold a meeting or if you need to share customer data with somebody, uh, you can get started and build your customer relationship management system and your, your meeting stuff, your online invoicing stuff. They got all kinds of stuff. Collaboration utilities where you can get out there and do stuff with people. Also, don't sleep on collaboration stuff. I probably should have made that. Uh, stuff like Google Docs and Office 365. So your Google Docs are going to allow you to like share docs, share resources. Uh, you're going to have like uh, different apps that you can share all in that Google space. Uh, same thing with Office 365 gives you the Office suite and all of that all in the cloud. There's tons of stuff like that. Okay, well I'm going to stop there. I hope this is a good little introduction to the cloud and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about other things. We'll get a little deeper into some of these things. We're going to be talking about specific things in this world like OpenStack. I know some people have been kind of asking me about stuff like that and I'll get to that but we had to cover a lot of basics first. But we'll get to the specific things like the differences between uh, VMware and all the ESX and ESXi stuff and how does that differ from OpenStack and what should you be learning. We can also talk about stuff like big data. So now what I'm going to be looking for is feedback. If you've liked these Whiteboard Friday videos that we've been producing, and hopefully you started checking out our brand new series called Talk Nerdy to Me, where we cover a little bit more technical stuff. Uh, you know, I try to keep Whiteboard Friday kind of high level. And Talk Nerdy to Me, we're going to get a little bit deeper into the weeds of what some of this terminology means. But back to what I was getting at. <clears throat> I'm really hoping to get feedback. I'm looking for topics, things that you want me to try to explain. So. Uh, when we come back, we'll start to cover uh, some more cloud and mobile related stuff. And I'm going to be looking for topics from you guys. All right, ninjas. See you next week on Whiteboard Friday. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.